If we, um, I guess, uh, return to the actual kind of origins of this with, with the Buddhist teachings, is the Four Noble Truths, is that a kind of a good place to start in terms of thinking about how this is kind of systematically laid out? Uh, yeah, <laughs> the Four Noble Truths actually within it contain it all, you know, and it's interesting just in my, in my teaching uh, career and, and writing, uh, when I first began teaching and in my first book, I had like a, I don't know, five, six page chapter on the Four Noble Truths. In my latest book, Mindfulness, that's become like, I don't know, 10 chapters, you know, which I'm saying just to indicate that we can, we can read it and get a kind of a basic generalized understanding of it, but there's tremendous depth contained within the teachings of the Four Noble Truths that can really dive into and explore. Uh, and it's, yeah, it's uh, tremendously rich. Right, and as you mentioned earlier that um, in the Theravada tradition, most of the texts are written in Pali, this, this language that was spoken at the time of the Buddha, um, yeah. and the Four Noble Truths right, are, are, are centered around dukkha, this, this word that's often translated as suffering. Right. Um, but I've heard you right. talk at length on, on the nuances of what that truly truly means. And I think um, there, was, right. there was, you know, unsatisfactoriness, I think I've heard you say, but also you spoke about the etymology of it as well, which um, I would love to, yeah, to hear, yeah. hear more about. Uh, yeah. So just uh, maybe just a, a little preface to that uh, of why um, the usual translation of dukkha is suffering uh, doesn't, doesn't seem to cover the whole, the whole meaning of it because uh, the Buddha taught that all conditioned things, which is everything we experience, all conditioned things are dukkha. So if we translate it as suffering, that's saying all conditioned things are suffering. But that doesn't really resonate, you know, with the reality of our lives. There are a lot of things that are pleasant and enjoyable and uh, we don't feel the suffering at all. But if we understand dukkha as ultimately unsatisfying or unreliable, you know, because they're changing, but, you know, nothing, nothing is lasting. So then in addition to dukkha, meaning the obvious kinds of suffering, like when things are painful, but it also includes everything, all conditioned things are dukkha in the sense they're incapable of providing lasting happiness, you know, or lasting ease or peace because of the truth of impermanence. Uh, so it's just important to, um, yeah, have this broader view uh, of understanding Dukkha. But now um, I forgot what the original question was. Yeah. <laughs> well, you, uh, I was queuing you up to, to talk about the etymology of it. All right, yes. Uh, so this is part of the Dukkha of aging. <laughs> uh, memory, <laughs> memory decline. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so this is something I, I'm not a poly scholar, you know, and so this is just something I read, uh, but it, it really resonated. Uh, someone described the etymology. Um, so do ka d u and then k h a, and one of the meanings or the etymology of. Uh, do means hard or difficult, uh, and ka they were describing as uh, the axle hole for a, you know, the axle in a cart fits into the hole in the wheel, you know. And so dukkha uh, was suggested means when that doesn't fit properly, it's quite a bumpy ride. And I actually had an experience of that one time uh, when I was uh, in Burma. Uh, some friends and, uh, and I had gone up to Upper Burma to visit Mahasi Sayadaw in his home monastery. So it was way, way out there. So we flew to Mandalay and then we, we had to take this, I don't know, a couple of hour uh, ride in an ox cart. <laughs> it was a pretty bumpy ride. <laughs> and so I could really understand the axle not quite fitting perfectly, you know, into the wheel. Uh, so it felt like a, a good image yeah. <laughs> for what dukkha means. 
a bumpy right. ride. Yeah, I think that's um, <clears throat> to a lot of people. I think yeah, the the first noble truth being translated as life is suffering can be a bit off putting. Um, but if yeah. if it's life yeah. is a bumpy ride, that sounds a lot more friendly and uh, <laughs> a lot more uh, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Um, and, and and sometimes there are big bumps and sometimes, you know, uh, just little ones, but uh, bumpy. <laughs> and then the other, the other truths right, uh, relate to the, um, is it the, the origin of, of, if we use the word suffering, and then the cessation of suffering, right. and then the path to the cessation of suffering. Is that right, a, good, right. a reasonable summary? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So there, there are two different, very closely related mind states. Uh, and that is of craving and clinging. So within the Four Noble Truths, they really bring it back. It's, it's almost as if craving is the precursor to clinging. You know, it's because of desire for something. And then if we get it, we cling to it. And if we cling to that, which in its very nature is changing, of course we suffer. You know, if we cling to youth, we're going to suffer when we get old. If we Linked to summer, we're going to suffer when we're, you know, it's cold. Um, somebody once described uh, the truth of uh, the dukkha of clinging as being rope burn. <laughs> you know, if you're trying to hold, a, hold on to a rope that somebody is pulling through your hand. So if we're trying to hold on to that which is changing, which is everything, of course, that clinging is going to result in different kinds of suffering. Craving, which is how it's described in the Four Noble Truths, it's like it brings it back a, a step before the clinging. And I found this uh, really an interesting uh, place to explore in meditation practice. Um, well, the Buddha talked about three kinds of craving. You know, one is craving for sense pleasures, which, you know, we're, we're all familiar with that. Uh, then he talked about craving for becoming, you know, of wanting to become this or that. So it's that quality of leaning forward into our experience. And then the final one is craving for non-becoming. But it's the second one that I found really interesting in meditation because even with very experienced practitioners, you know, once, once the practice is really rolling along and has become more effortless and we're at ease in it, there's a very strong tendency to be leaning into the next moment. So this is just craving on a moment to moment. You know, we're with the in-breath in order to get to the out-breath. Or we're feeling a sensation in order for it to ease a little bit. Or just some, some element of that leaning into. And I really began to see that that leaning into on a moment to moment level is exactly this craving for becoming. So I had a, I'll just share with you, a, quite a, a striking understanding come in a, um, in my meditation and retreat I was doing. So I was sitting and things were just moving along quite you know, easily. And then there was this one line from the text that came to mind, which I had read a million times before. It was very familiar to me whatever has the nature to arise will also pass away. You know, and in the text, very often, if people hear that, they get enlightened. You know, so if one could hear it in the right way. So I had heard that. I'd read it a lot. But at this particular time, because I was sitting and my practice was, seemed to be going well, uh, that phrase kind of dropped right into the meditative process. Somehow it became more alive for me, not just an intellectual concept. So I'm in this changing process and then that thought or reflection, whatever has the nature to arise will also pass away. And I re realized, therefore there's nothing to want. I'm talking about on this meditative level because whatever it is I might want, even for the next moment, is gonna also pass away. So when my, when I saw that, you know, very vividly experientially, oh, whatever has an edge to rise will also pass away. Therefore, there's nothing to want. I could feel my mind in that moment drop back from that leaning into. You know, and it was, it was just so vivid. And the dropping back 
really highlighted the second and third noble truth, which is, you know, craving is the cause of the dukkha, and the end of dukkha is the end of craving. Uh, and so when I felt the mind drop back, even from that subtle leaning into the next moment, it was that really vivid experience. Oh, the mind really of non-craving. And even though, you know, it didn't last <laughs> for that long, <laughs> but it was very clear. You know? And so I really appreciated that we don't have to wait until we're fully enlightened to experience the third noble truth. We can experience it even for moments, you know, when we drop back from craving. <laughs>